Again, thank you everybody for joining us. This is Laura O'Brien. I am CEO of Connect Consulting Services. Um, we look forward to hearing from you about your um, your active shooter workplace violence issues, and um, we want to hear comments from you. But before we do that, we're going to go into our content for the day. We're going to say today talk about workplace violence policy, active threat, because a lot of people just think it's all active shooter. The threat could be from a person with just a fist or with some other kind of weapon that they might be brandishing. And we want to talk about some tools to keep your employees safe. So uh, many of you have, um, so this is a little bit about me and a little bit about our company. So I am Nora O'Brien. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Connect Consulting Services. So uh, my entire career in emergency management has been in healthcare, but so much of what we do translates to other industries. But so we launched, I launched Connect Consulting Services in 2009. I can't believe it's been 11 years in business. We really are about assisting our clients in developing emergency management and business continuity plans, training programs, drills, and exercises. I have a master's degree with Parkland Park University in public affairs but disaster and emergency management. Um, I'm a certified emergency manager and serve as the IAEM healthcare caucus chair for two years. Um, I've also been involved in disaster activation from as early as Hurricane Katrina to recently as the campfire in 2018. Um, also FEMA inject instructor. Okay, where our training objectives for today is to discuss workplace violence, Kind of for each phase of emergency management. Also discuss managers and supervisors, what you are, for those of you on the call that are managers, um, what your reporting responsibilities are and in order to keep your employees safe. Um, to describe workplace violence policy and uh, procedure best practices, and then have a discussion with you all about um, how we can improve um, how we can improve uh, your emergency act management and workplace violence policy. Okay, so let's go right into workplace violence decline. Um, so it's any physical assault, threatening behavior, verbal abuse, and conduct that's sufficiently severe, offensive, intimidating um, to cause individuals to reasonably fear for their own safety. And when a lot of people, when they look at this uh, definition, they think, oh, um, they think, oh my gosh, um, with, you know, they think that, what, what do you mean? This, I don't actually have to, it could be that you feel intimidated. It doesn't necessarily mean you actually have had um, someone that um, actually hurt you in the workplace. It could be if you have feel the threat of a potential workplace violence event, that is considered a workplace violence. Um, Okay, so a couple of facts. So every year, more than 2 million American workers report being victimized by workplace violence, um, uh, which costs employers more than $120 billion a year. And this is you know, recent estimates from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And according to the Bureau of Labor, uh, Labor Statistics in 2016, Workers in private industry experienced trauma from workplace violence. You know, they were they were required days away from work. And of those victims, 70% were female, 67% 20, uh, were age 25 to 54, 70% worked in healthcare or social services, and 21% required 31 or more days away from work to recover from that event. Okay. There's five different types of workplace violence. And this might be a surprise to some of you because you think, well, there's just, it just happens in the workplace. Someone just kind of um, loses their lunch and, you know, isn't there just one type? But actually, there's five different types. And for you to think about it, as you develop your workplace violence policy, it's good to know kind of how, and, and you can create a program that allows. A, for you to address each of these different types of workplace violence. Number one is the employer focus. So if you're the supervisor 
a person loses their job or isn't doing well in the workplace and they have, you know, uh, they're perpetrated violence against, you know, their employer. Um, you know, they, I don't really like what you have to say and I'm going to come back and get a gun or those kinds of things. That's employer focus. Now, domestic focus is also another big, big factor. On the domestic focus side, it could be a person that is in the workplace that's in a relationship that's um, impacted by domestic violence. Um, or they themselves are the perpetrator and they go um, you know, and they perpetrate that violence against an individual, but that's in the workplace. So it's domestic, so it's not really, it's just the workplace happens to be where that individual is. Um, but uh, we've seen this kind of, uh, unfortunately, really sad events happen, but domestic focus is another way to think about it. And we'll talk about some of those risk factors and the kinds of things that you can look for for individuals that might be experiencing these kinds of events. Property focus, acts against property that's company owned, like I really don't like Comcast and I'm gonna go beat up that truck or gonna beat up that person you know, it's property, I'm going to just, you know, I don't really, I, I really hate that they left me on, on, you know, on the phone for two hours, you know, last week, and I didn't get my help, and I see this Comcast, I'm going to lose, you know, I'm going to lose my cool and, and take a tire iron to a, a, a truck. Commercial focus, where they take it, um, an, issue, an issue where they take um, part in, um, Violence against, so this is maybe you work for a utility and I'm going to go cut the power lines or et cetera. And the other one that's really tough and why there's a question mark there is ideological focus. So we happen to know that, you know, we're in a diverse culture, diverse world. People have ideologies. Some are well accepted. Some are um several outside the mainstream, but ideological focus they have and whatever that may be, and it could be religious, it could be a uh, terrorist attack, et cetera. But the ideological focused events, um, you know, it happens to be where you are working in your workplace. So the question mark is, it just depends on that individual, but in, they, they might be driven to act and perpetrate an act of violence based on a specific ideology. But and it could be something that's well-defined, but it could be something that like I said, not mainstream or um, maybe, maybe it may or may not be lucid. The individual may not be lucid. So those are the five different types of violence. Okay. Um, five phases of emergency management. The important thing to know about emergency management is that a lot of individuals like to think that we, um, we as emergency managers, we're just doing what we can when response happens and we're responding based on our plans and we're trying to recover. Well, there's actually, there's a couple of other steps to before a disaster may happen, whatever it may be. So on the mitigation side, it could be things that are structural or non-structural, um, things that you can do to prevent that event from happening. For example, um, you know, mitigation activity, you know, could be structural like, um, seismic retrofitting or mitigation can be a new badging system for security and so the person doesn't have a badge and then they can't get into your building and it'll perpetrate violence. On the prevention side is um, prevention measures that you can put in, design standards, environmental planning, it could be evacuation plans, but that preventing that an event to happen. And on the preparedness side, we're looking at planning and training and drills and exercises and writing stuff down and refining your plans and the preparedness that the whole point of the phases is and why it's essentially it's a circle is that that mitigation happens you do that prevention you do the preparedness and then the whole whole point is your response is as efficient as possible because you have done that pre-thinking about what steps you want your organization to take, who's in charge, what, um, you know, what am I, what are my action steps? More importantly, how am I going to, how is my organization going to recover? So that prepares, and then the, and the whole, the whole point is you're going to have some lessons learned and you take those lessons learned and update your plan based on those findings and put it back into your mitigation preparedness and prevention programs. So that's the five phases. So 
we're going to talk a little bit about today how to frame your workplace violence policy and program kind of built on these best practices of emergency management. So how can you mitigate workplace violence? You're like, okay, well, a couple of things that are really can be helpful is a zero tolerance policy. Do you have within your organization a zero, zero tolerance policy for kinds of activities that are, are going to keep your, that, that would make your employees less safe? For example, someone brand, you know, brings it, do you have a gun policy? Do you have a weapon policy? Those kinds of things. And if whatever you can do, and if those weapons are not at work, you know, are not in the workplace, they're less likely to injure your employees. Um, so that's one way to mitigate some workplace violence. As I said, another example would be badging. Um, you do a new security badging that with all different levels of support, you mean that it limits the access of your employees to that perpetrator, whether it's, again, employer-focused, um, employer-focused domestic violence, et cetera. Um, the other thing we want to talk about on the mitigation side is for you to develop an identification system for potential violence, you know, and threats and figure out some support for individuals that may happen. Um, this behavioral threat assessment is something that you can do. There's some proactive tools that you can, um, proactive tools that are really helpful so that you're not actually reacting to that event. You're figuring out in advance what those individuals might impact. You know what 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 kinds of things of, of individuals that might perpetrate violence and figuring out in advance how to support them if they're if they want you know how you can limit your or other employees access to that individual but i figuring out a behavioral threat assessment you know it's you know it's a you're preventing that targeted violence and then you know why why do we want to protect instead of just react is as quickly as law enforcement you think can respond, it's often too late to prevent casualties. Most of, if you want to refer to active shooter events, are within 10 minutes. You know, you know, law enforcement's amazing in this, you know, in, this, in, in the U.S. Um, in, in many communities, if you're in more rural settings, it might be an hour before law enforcement gets to you, and an event might be far, you know, past the time, and there might be, uh, as I said, more casualties and more individuals. Um, on the prevention side, how to develop workplace violence prevention plans. Do you train, this is a question for you all when we get to the discussion session, is do you um, train your staff on your workplace violence plans? Do you identify some risk factors um, and warning signs, which I'll talk about in a bit? Do you teach your staff how to de-escalate in an event? Um, you know, if you hear something, you really want to teach your employees to say something. So that's really important. Um, and how to re, re, how do you report workplace violence incidences or things that make your employees uncomfortable? You know, they're like, oh, well, maybe I won't do that. So I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. We're, we're going to get there. So when you're actually in the situation, how do you react? To trouble, do you, you know, do you fight, do you, do you flight, or, or do you freeze? You know, really kind of depends, and it is good to know in advance. And this is where the drills and exercises on the prevention side are really key. Um, do you happen to know what kind of person you are? Do you know that you're going to go back and you're going to fight, or do you know you're a person that you're just going to get out of dodge, which is very important as well? Or are you going to be a person that freezes? So knowing that in advance helps you, should you be in that kind of situation, knowing in advance what that is. So that's where those, like I said, the drills and exercises really comes in. So, do you, you know, does your body know how to, in, I, you know, I, and identify that, that impact that may happen? You know, do you, how do you stand, talk, interact with someone, you know, really impact how they stand, talk, and interact? You know, how do you do, how do you different physical situations impact how you de-escalate, you know, well, and, you know, do you know what you're committing to de-escalating? So you can't de-escalate every kind of, every kind of incident, you know, a person has a gun and will, um, you know, it's, it's going to, it's going to vary based on the, on the scenario that you're, you're faced with, but 
it's just kind of good. So that's where that we talk about drills and exercises all the time. And it's something that we um, in emergency management say is crucial to really kind of know in advance what your, you know, what the situation is. And so that's where those, those drill and exercise pieces of prevention are key. Um, you know, and then how your body reacts, um, you know, is um, how your body reacts is really, um, is as important. And it's just gonna make different in the situation, the other individual um, or your colleagues might, you know, might have a different reaction. So it's just good to know in advance. All right, so it's important to know too on the prevention side about the escalating behavior. Now, oftentimes, you, when someone doesn't usually go from zero to the peak here and in in looking at this graph, you know, they don't go from zero to 60, so to speak, or zero to 100 overnight. There's usually some kind of trigger in agitation and you know, acceleration, and then there's some peak situation. So, you know, the question for you all is in your plan, in your workplace violence plan, have you figured out or you had do you train your staff on what those what that escalating behavior looks like? Um, and I'll talk about that next with when we're talking about the um, the pathway. So there are some violence warning behaviors for you to think about. And this information, this slide actually came to us from, an, from another training that we did. We say in emergency management, we steal shamelessly, we share selflessly. Um, that's, that's just the way it is. This actually came from, this, um, from the US Secret Service um, and the kinds of pathway warning behaviors that they look for. Um, again, someone doesn't get to zero to 60 overnight. Um, they're usually some kind of event that they have, there's some kind of trigger. So these are, these warning behaviors, we want you to think about them. Do you know of uh, these kind of warning behaviors? Have you witnessed these kinds of warning behaviors in, um, in your workplace or and it doesn't necessarily be where you personally work. It could be you are getting your tires, um, you know, getting your tires service and you see this kind of behavior. So again, going back to say, um, uh, say something, see something, say something. So a pathway warning behavior. So with someone that is maybe wanting to per per perpetrate really intense violence, pathway be warning behaviors that you might witness or know people that have witnessed is this is the person that's figuring out, you know, if they're gonna go shoot up a school, which is horrific and we all know this, you know, um, this person or this kind of worry behavior is they are researching exit routes. They are purchasing ammo. They're figuring out the process. They're gonna figure out, they're gonna buy the, you know, whatever it is the, you know, the tactical gear that's necessary. They're figuring out their pathway to that warning behavior, and which is horrific. But should you happen to see someone that is, you know, plant um, on that pathway, seeing something, saying something is really important, then you might actually be able to stop them. Uh, and that there has been lots of uh, lots of data out there in instances where. If someone said something like, that's not passing my smell test, something's not, my gut's telling me this is not right. Fixation warning behavior. There are people that are fixated on, you know, you know, um, we're not going to get into a long discussion about mental health, but if someone has a fixation with like a serial killer or Jeffrey Dahmer or Manson or, you know, the Columbine kid, shooters or whoever that may, and they're fixated or they're fixated on an individual that maybe it's somebody who went to school like 20 years ago and because of, we would just say a mental illness that may or may not be treated, they're fixated and they're doing something that, on that, that impacts that fixation. Again, saying something, seeing something is really key at this point. You know, it could be, uh, 
the identification warning behaviors, and these are kind of oftentimes the fixation and the identification are somewhat similar, is that they identify. They are of the they're a loner, just like the Columbine, you know, uh, killer. Like all, but again, the column those those individuals, they're high school students. They need to identify. I feel the same way. I, you know, I, and they might be sharing with you individually. They might be sharing it on Twitter. They might be putting it on Facebook. They might be writing it in a journal. But that identification warning behavior, again, that is another one that's a, a, a scary one. The novel aggression warning behavior. This is like out of the blue. They either blow a gasket over something you or I. That's a bummer, right? Like, let's say I cut you off in traffic. Okay, maybe I could have driven better that day, but you know, bummer. You and I were saying bummer. The novel aggression, they might be losing their lunch over something that's essentially a small transgression, and they get, you know, they have an outsized response to that event. You know, a, a good example of this novel aggression warning behavior is. The individual that the family was on the highway, this was in Arizona uh, last summer, family was on the highway. I think you know that they might have cut off a cut off another driver. The driver followed this family home and shot, you know, followed this family home and shot into their car and killed one of their children. You know, that's like out of nowhere, you know. You or I, again, that's part of that escalation. And we don't know what happened, you know, preceded those, that kind of event, but that novel aggression comes out of nowhere. Energy burst. So that energy burst warning behavior is an like they might be, you know, they've had figured out their pathways on the, you know, the very first bullet. But energy burst is they are buying that ammo. Before they were just figuring it out, right? Whereas their energy burst and they are in go mode and they're figuring and, and they're just putting together all that situation. Um, so energy burst, again, if you're seeing something, saying something, whether you're an employee or whether it's the person that works at the 7 Eleven down the street from you, that is also something, an opportunity for you to say something. Leakage. We see leakage quite a bit. Um, Again, people post, post their little manifesto, I'm saying in air quotes, they're, um, you know, I'm going to go shoot up a school, I'm going to go, um, I'm going to shoot up a school, I'm going to go, no one loves me, I'm going to shoot myself, I'm going to take down other people with me, whatever the thing is. That leakage warning behavior, that's their way of, hey, I told the whole world. You know what's going on, and maybe they only told two people or they're blocked. But that leakage warning behavior is again that's something that something's coming that you know, uh, warning might be happening. So that leakage warning behavior again is something good example. This happened um, about two years ago in um, Minnesota. A woman had um, children, um, she, she has Facebook friends with a number of folks outside of her area and somehow someone on Facebook in another state um, saw a picture of her children and shared in a leakage messaging that she was going to go kill her children and also go shoot up a school. And it, and it the way he described his actions or what he the actions he wanted to take, she actually called the jurisdiction where uh, this individual was, and, and it was somebody that she didn't know personally, was a friend of a friend kind of thing. And they actually showed up to his house because of her gut sense of something's not right, something's not acting myself up here. And they, the individual, the law enforcement showed up to his house, and he was on his way. His car was stocked with ammo. Um, and he was on his way to to the school to perpetrate violence against the school, but they they stopped it. So that leakage behavior is real important. The last resort. And this is where if this happens one more time, again they're going to blow their gasket. 
and then communicated, I'm going to go shoot up that school tomorrow at, you know, two o'clock, et cetera. These kinds of, and you can see the pathway, that's sort of like the beginning often, and all the way up to the communicated threat. Somebody saw something. Good example, 2014 San Bernardino shooters. They lived in a small two-bedroom apartment in San Bernardino. They had 9,000 rounds of ammo in their second bedroom in this tiny apartment. Someone had to see that, whether it's the Amazon driver who kept on donating, kept on bringing box and box and box after, or a neighbor that's seeing them walk, you know, show up with 9,000 rounds of ammo. That's not something, you know, you or I can't have two boxes of Sudafed before the FDA knows about it. Somehow, um, 9,000 rounds of ammo showed up. So again, not saying that that could have been stopped. I'm just saying, See something, something. These these violent warning behavior. Um, um, it's important to know what these warnings are. It's important to um, it's important to move forward. Okay. So the other thing about it's not just all those kinds of um, warning signs that you're going to see. It's the physical warning signs of of individuals. So these are kind of the action steps, but the early recognition of those warning signs is, you know, if they're pacing, if they're restless, if they have those clenched fists, you know, if they're loud, if they're in excessively insistent, I'm like, no, my bill is not X amount. And instead of this, you know, those kinds of things, cursing, quick movements, threats. So if you're seeing, if you and your employees are seeing this kind of behavior, what are you going to do about it? There are some things you can do, but you know it can lead obviously to those events that we're we're concerned about. The next slide is oftentimes we see these kinds of things. Um, in 81% of incidences that have happened, and this is I think from 2017 figures. This is also from the um, Secret Service uh, presentation. 81% of incidences of previous events, at least one person had prior knowledge of the attack. And in 59% of the instances, more than one person had prior knowledge. So why don't we report it? Oftentimes, this is what we hear, I might be wrong, maybe I'm wrong. No, that's that's fine, right? That's okay. No, that, 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 does, that doesn't seem right, but you don't want to be wrong. You don't want to get this person in trouble. You don't want retali you don't want to be retaliating against the case this guy is this guy or gal um, is, you know, you know, they're gonna retaliate against me. You know, another one we see is they won't believe me, you know, and I don't want to snitch. But the next one is I don't want to snitch on this person. You know, this person has a hard time or they're going through a real, they're going through a really rough patch or they in a you know, but how how do you get behind this effect? And um it's a one of the best practices um we one how do you get around it's called the bystander effect. Like you see what's happening, you see that this person is intent on whatever their intentions may be of, of perpetrating violence, is how you get behind this effect is anonymous reporting. So this is the best practice that we highly recommend that you have a system that you can, within your workplace say, or if you're, let's say you, you see someone that says something at the um, you know, 7-Eleven down the street, is an opportunity to report what's going on. And that, so they don't have to worry about retaliation, or you know, if they get enough of these reports, and you as an well, those for those of you on the call that are um, uh, supervisors or managers, you're you're required to keep your employees safe. So that's one best practice that we highly recommend. Okay, de-escalation. So we talked about sort of what those what are those triggers or what are those kind of physical warning signs of, um, of work, potential workplace violence. So there are some de-escalation techniques 
it's just important that you know so much of what we communicate on a daily basis is nonverbal. Again, clenched fist, you can say, I'm fine, and you have a clenched fist. You know, you're saying the words, or I'm fine, and you don't have a clenched fist. So that nonverbal signs of violence is real important. It's just kind of knowing what to say and what not to say. And this is a, and you know, it's easier said than done. But essentially, you want to tell people things like calm down. Because clearly, if they're not calm, tell them to calm down. It's very condescending. That doesn't work. Again, paying attention to your gut instinct. Going back to say something, do something. Because if your gut instinct is like, that's not, have something's up, right? Your own heart rate and your perspiration and your nausea, nausea and feeling indecisive and maybe hair on the back of your neck. Oh my gosh. That de escalation uh, policy is that, that something's not right. I'm going to have to de escalate the situation. You may not be a person that likes conflict. But when you're faced with a potential event, you just do the best you can. But those zero tolerance policies are in place for, again, if you're, if you're seeing these things that are just not making your employees feel safe, having those zero tolerance policies help to mitigate future events. The other thing about um, de-escalation is body language is really important. You know, posture, you wanna be on equal footing with them. You don't want to touch them. You want to have your palms open. You also don't want, um, you know, you don't want to touch people you don't know, you know, or hey, is it okay? Can I put a hand, you know, my hand on your shoulder or something? But your posture is really key. Um, also, if you're sitting down or they're sitting down, you don't want to stand above them because, again, you're not on equal footing with them because they might feel more threatened and they might perpetrate more. Uh, 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 more, more have a higher propensity to perpetrate if they're sitting down and you're standing over them and they're gonna wanna go for the throat, so to speak. Neutral face, you know, think about when you've dealt with a toddler before and they just, they really can't be reasoned with, you know, they're crying, I mean, crying for 45 minutes because they wanna wear a red shirt. By the way, they're wearing a red shirt, but that doesn't matter. They're, you obviously can't, you know, yeah, a neutral face, um, harder to engage with, not hostile, not, you know, not happy. You're talking low and slow. You don't want to scream at them or, again, say, don't say, you know, gentle and firm tone. And you, again, not saying calm, calm down. Eye contact is important, helps to humanize. And, you know, sometimes that helps, sometimes not. Um, don't be afraid to pause or just do nothing and maybe take a deep breath. Maybe they'll take one with you, and sometimes that might de escalate the situation. Allow for the situation. You don't want to block someone, um, exit if you want. Again, they might uh, allow them to, or require, uh, they might be higher propensity to want to run, et cetera, if, if you try to hold them in some ways. And don't point or shake fingers. I don't, that's not going to help the situation. It never helps anybody, but people still do it. That's a whole other situation. Um, and then the de-escalation. So it, there's a tipping point with de-escalation. It's not going to work if you're faced with, you know, someone that with a weapon. It's just not. You know, that's where when you're faced with an active shooter event or, you know, a person with a weapon, the muscle memory skills of run, hide, fight really do kick in. They have to be activated. And as we mentioned about the drills and exercises are really key um that, that's important okay so preparing for uh, a workplace violence event um what a lot of people like to think is well i don't want to i i really i think i might scare my employees if we have a you know active shooter event um, or active shooter exper um, exercises that kind of thing but Giving your skill, giving those skills to your staff, that muscle memory is crucial. Um, that you know they they may not need those need those skills in your workplace. They might be in future workplaces, or they might be in a 7-Eleven. I don't know why I keep on saying the 7-Eleven, but okay. Um, but that planning and exercises are those core emergency management functions. 
Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, for the managers and supervisors um, on the line is under OSHA, Occupational Safety, Health and Safety um, Administration, an employer has the legal duty to provide a safe workplace for all employees, free from hazards that are likely to cause death or serious harm or injury. You know, and an incident of workplace violence is presumed to be work related that results in an event during the workplace, obviously. And employers can be found in violation of the general duty clause if they fail to reduce or eliminate those serious um, and recognized hazards. Like if you know someone that, again, they're making potential threats, they're making people uneasy, uh, they, you know, you as an employer, if whether that, you know, they're, they're in the workplace, whether they're an employee, or they um, are a customer of your uh, in your workplace. You're required by law to keep your employees safe. And as a duty of care, and this is on the national stage, and you should check with the the, the uh, state regulations around this, is that if you knew or you should have known, you know that there are potential potential violence, like there had been a threat against your school or against your uh, healthcare organization, etc. You are considered liable, you as an employer or manager. So it's just important to know, understand that duty of care. And this is something that, and, and you can obviously ha have a good workplace violence policy to again, recognize that we, we know that we wanna keep our employees as safe as possible, but that negligence, like if you, for example, knew that there was a threat that you didn't do anything about, again, you're, you know, it could be hiring, training, retaining employees that, you know, you're not supervising them well, you're not, you know, giving them accurate references, you're not fail, failing to respond to targeted victims. You yourself could be, as, an, as a supervisor or manager, can be found liable. And then exposure, you know, for discrimination, harassment claims, that's something that's required. Okay, so other things, now in going back to, the work performance issues. So you as an employer, you're going to see these things, like let's say this person, whether it's domestic, uh, a potential domestic violence situation, a domestic um, event, or it could be, um, you know, it could be related to just um, get employer focused or property focused. Whatever, there are general, again, just as there were risk factors in, you see how people may, may or may not escalate an event. If you're seeing these kinds of things, and if you're an employee, you also might be seeing these things. You might have a person that is not showing up to work on a regular time, on a regular, and like maybe they've always been really regular, but again, they're going through a hard time or whatever that may be. These are the kinds of things to look for, attendance problems. Decreased productivity, if like your other employees have to, to do this other person's job because maybe they're in a domestic violence situation or they may perpetrate violence because they're having difficulty focusing at work or whatever the need. But if they're all of a sudden, um, they are not as productive as they have been in the past, those are some patterns to look for. Also inconsistent patterns. Like for example, they're showing up to work every single day for one week, and then the next week they show up for one or two days and don't bother calling. Also, maybe they're there, but they're not concentrating very much, and they're on their phone constantly. Um, they're, you know, I'm not saying just Facebook, but they're they're having difficulty concentrating, or they're sitting at their desk, they're staring into space, staring into space, or and they they might have a, a huge amount of drag on your your supervisor. And then I'm spending, you know, 20% of my time with one employee out of the 50 that I have because X situation, that might be some work performance issues to look for. And then, you know, a huge amount of personal calls and distractions. And again, those are some things to look for. Uh, and the question uh, for you all is, do you have these kinds of policies in your, uh, in your organization? Okay, I'm going to talk about some workplace violence preparedness strategies. So, and these are some simple things that you can do that help your organization be safe. Um, 
review your workplace violence plans and procedures annually. You know, things change. You have new badging systems than you did a year ago. You, you know, anytime you update um, some kind of system or you have more locations or whatever that is, looking at those kind of putting that as a best practice um, in your plans for what, hey, what does our workplace violence plans look like? You know, take incident reports from staff and visitors seriously. That's really important. You know, again, going back to the anonymous reporting, do you have it available as a best practice? Um, you know, hold a lunch and learn about workplace violence response plans, you know, with your staff. It doesn't have to be, you know, that I'm spending, you know, eight hours doing this. It's something that you can have a discussion, have everyone bring their lunch, and you talk about, hey, this is what our workplace policy policy is and when you're talking about that you may have an opportunity to update and then go oh you know this is a better we now do this this is our process for x and you make sure that opportunity to update that um teaching de-escalation techniques for staff let's say you're a really high customer service kind of industry uh you're dealing with the public all the time that de-escalation people might de-escalate need just the escalation because they don't like their bill or they don't like their teacher or whatever the thing is, understanding that how to safely de-escalate an event um, can happen. And conducting workplace violence, active shooter drills, tabletop exer or discussion-based exercises, full-scale exercises with law enforcement and other planning partners help are some great strategies. Um, and then update your plans based on your after-action report. The other thing that it's a nice preparedness strategy is um, I want to put want to put a slide in this, but like I know that many folks have lanyards that they wear every day for work. A really simple thing is to there are different types of lanyards um, that are referred to as a breakaway, um, and what a breakaway is basically it if if it's tugged on. Um, it'll break away. Um, oftentimes, if you're a person that wears a lanyard and you might be, uh, and there's someone want to perpetrate violence, they could grab you by the lanyard and it might be a choking, it's a choking hazard. So having just a simple thing is having lanyards with a breakaway means that less likely that an individual is a choking hazard. Okay, when, re when response happens. So Regardless of how severe the event took place, there are key emergency management um, systems that you can meet um, to, to manage the event. Um, you know, how are you required to respond to a threat that is carried out? And, and the question is, do you know who's in charge? Are you gonna shelter in place? Are you gonna stay put because you're gonna have to barricade because this individual, you know, might, um, are you run hide fighting? Are you figuring that out? So figuring out that process on the response side. The other thing on around emergency management on the next slide is, do you have a system for managing an incident? No, this is not just the good thing about incident command. It's a worldwide standard for managing instances is that you have a system of who's in charge, what's going to be, what steps are going to take, who, who are those roles and responsibilities are? Are those people trained on those roles and responsibilities? Yeah. Incident command is the worldwide standard to set for managing whatever kind of incident, whether it's the water horizon or whether it's a, you know an act, active shooter event in your workplace. But another best practice is having incident command team. Um, a couple of other things about on the response side is other best practices. Are your staff trained on life safety or first aid? You know, maybe, uh, are they, or even CPR? So that's important to know. Are you, again, act, are you uh, evacuating your shelter in place? Other kinds of response issues you might have to consider is law enforcement chain of custody issues. So like someone used a weapon and the uh, law enforcement wants to know which weapon was used and weapons left behind. So figuring out who's in charge um, of that, making sure that that weapon um, is handled appropriately with the law enforcement. So figuring out 
one of your policies of who's going to be in charge of that. Do you already have security on hand? And are they trained on figuring out what to do with the chain of custody? Um, who's going to talk to the media? What are they going to say? That's important. Because oftentimes in these kinds of large events, if it's, you know, if it's going to impact the community, the media is going to want to know Twitter and it's not just media. It's also going to go out on, you know, all social media as well. Do you, who's going to talk to the media? What are they going to say? What, it, you know, what information do you know? What can you release? What can't you release? Figuring out some planning considerations for that. And then, you know, do you, are you going to close your office, you know, location temporarily? Do you know where your employees will work short term and long term? And then recovery on the recovery side is, you know, how are you going to communicate to everybody what happened? Do you have to have a reunification center set up for if there's a large number of individuals that you're um, that were impacted, you know, whether it's your school or hospital or whatever it may be? Do you have a unification center? Um, is there building damage? Is there repairing? Is there repair, you know, cleanup? Um, the other piece that a lot of people think about is the physical side of, of um, an active shooter event, but there's also the mental health piece is often people may have a public, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder kind of response. And there might be an employee or it might be someone that goes to that 7-Eleven where that, where that event happened. So that understanding are there employee assistance programs that you can rely on, are those that on your fingertips um, for some kind of event. And thinking about a business continuity plan, again, where you're going to staff going to work and where they get, whether it's going to be temporary or long-term and then how can insurance help to support um, any of those kinds of events. Recovery versus continuity. On the recovery is, you know, how are you going to account from everybody, staff, visitors, vendors, um, damage, damage PT, you know, PTSD, um, stress debriefing, and if you can't reopen for two or two weeks, two months, a year, what are you going to do? Workers' comp and employee pay. The question is, can we have a copy of your presentation deck? Yes, we will be sending out a presentation slide. To everybody that re that registered. Oh, there's we will also be posting this video to YouTube. So if you want to share this with any of your friends or coworkers or management, um, we will be sending out the link in an email, and you'll be able to access it that way. That should be up in a couple of hours. Yeah. So I'll look for that. We have a question. How do you handle verbal conflict between employees? Very good question. Thank you. So the question is, how do you handle verbal conflict between employees? The issue is, if they're both in the workplace, do you want to sit there and be a mediator? Are you paid to be a mediator between two employees? Maybe they went out with the same guy or whatever, whatever. And it, you know, they use, use the same. You know, so does it really matter what the event may be? The verbal conflict, what number one again goes back to the zero tolerance policy. Um, do you have, um, if people are not feeling safe in the workplace, you're required to make sure that they are. If that, if it's something, if you can ascertain it's something that is not likely to, it only between those two, you can always as a manager say, can you take this outside? You know, can you, um, you know, can you take the situation outside? Can you, let's figure out a policy, you know, try to limit the involvement in as, as few employees as possible, um, that sort of situation. We think that that's the best strategy. Then there's another question. Okay, that's um, a great question. Yeah. I think it's from the same one. Um, other employees heard there are witnesses, but management was not there. So that goes back to the reporting. So the manager wasn't there to say what would happen, the conflict between the employees. That's where even if you just do anonymous anonymous reporting and say, hey, by the way, this is what I saw, this is what the situation was, this is when it happened, and um, how they can how they can be helped. How do you teach them how to react in these situations? 
you have to one number one they have to be adults <laughs> i mean for the most part you're not dealing with uh individuals that are um they're not children so you expect them to act as an adult if they can act accordingly maybe they can't stay in your workplace okay so while wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of uh, links but we want to give you some workplace violence resources these are um but to me that were really helpful osha safety training cdc has a great one on NIOSH and violence uh, violence prevention workplace violence 911 essentially crisis prevention so and that's a solution there's a workplace violence um toolkit that um i think it's association of hospital organizations so those are some resources that may work for your organization and a couple other things just a little bit about us you know we we shared a fair amount of information and within you know the hour we've been together but what what connect consulting services is all about is we do our best to create safer disaster resilient organizations and communities through our innovative approaches to building really robust emergency management and business continuity training programs, um, uh, that's that's just an exercise for us. Just a little bit about us. Um, this is a little bit about the next slide about our services. Um, we've been in business since 2009. We do emergency management, emergency operations planning, business continuity planning training drills exercises actually active sh active shooter workplace violence de-escalation we do planning and training if you're looking for your next keynote um or you're looking for a conference speaker for your organization please let us know we do that all of the time um and then compliance audit and improvement planning that's something that's big for us as well there's a couple more questions that came in yeah um, for, for preparedness, when is the best time for a debriefing or to conduct an after action report? So when you do an exercise, you want to write an after action report because the whole point is, the whole point of the exercise is not just to do the exercise and you pat yourself on the back. It's to find plan gaps. So the after action report and improvement plan is really an opportunity to say, this is what we did well, and here's where we found the plan gaps because our plan didn't give us enough guidance on how to deal with ABC, XYZ. And so um, that after action report, you want to do it as quickly as possible. And then most importantly, take the plan findings that you found of, oh, we really need more clarification on X. Take those plan findings and then update your plan based on those findings. Um, is there a similar PowerPoint where you can share on the verbal conflicts or hostile environment? Um, Verbal conflicts. Um, yeah, we can share our information. Yeah. All right. Um, we also want to share a couple of other things that we can might be able to help you. So we actually, um, many of you are health organizations that we've worked with all the time. Um, we have a CMS Emergency Preparedness Compliance Toolkit, our 2020 version. Um, we're right in the process of finalizing one of the final touches on the 20. Um, 2020 version where with the 2019 version you purchase it today for 500 you get two hours of consulting you'll get the 2020 version for free that is and highlighted that is um it's a hot link and goes directly to um or or you can just do a direct download and thank you so much but it has all of the changes to the omnibus reduction act burden reduction act um streamline more user-friendly will and then also has a provided reference chart and all the changes about when you have to do your drills and exercises so that's our compliance toolkit and if you have any questions be happy to help um we have a, one other resource we wanted to share with you is that um we have a sample workplace violence policy that actually is in our toolkit um if you book a call with us here there's a direct link to us or you can go straight to our website and book some time with us to schedule a call and learn more about your organization, um, we'll we'll give you a copy of our workplace violence policy sample. Um, and also, too, we have other webinars uh, coming up. So March 26th, how to build a CMS compliance program, and April 22nd, we're going to do one on infectious disease planning and talk about uh, coronavirus um, 
and all its um, all the situation and all the update on that. And we also have a monthly newsletter, so you can find out all the good stuff about us. And that lastly, that's our contact information. If we are right at 1059, if we look forward to hearing from you. Anything that we can do to support your emergency management or business continuity, planning, training, drills, exercise programs, please let us know how we can help. Thank you so much for joining.